call the meeting to order. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ginny, would you please take the roll? Collins? Here. Coyle? Here. Iker? Here. Lee? Here. Patras? Here. Yusuf Abramson? Here. Owen? Here. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start with 207's best. Uh, this month it is for community service. And are we able to start with Maine East? Yes. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would like to call up Rehan Kaja. Rehan. It is an honor to share with you Maine East nominee for 207's Best this month, Rayhan Kaja. Rayhan is a true leader amongst the Maine East school community. He has a passion for bringing people together for the sake of service and shows in his contributions over his high school career. Rayhan has a lengthy resume filled with community service activities through his involvement in National Honor Society, Our Code Student Leaders, Principals Advisory Council, and Muslim Student Association, just to name a few. He is a worthy recipient of this award, however, because of his dedication to leadership in the area of community service. Rayhan is not only putting in the hours for our community, his creativity and drive to make a difference sets him apart as a leader. When Rayhan was asked what his motivation is in creating and leading service opportunities for his peers and community, he shared that, quote, I believe that if someone is genuinely invested in helping the students, then we are able to be one, rather than just a bunch of people that go to Maine East. That's important in school. Working together is what makes the difference. Rayhan surely has brought people together. This past summer, Rayhan organized a car wash fundraiser to support the victims of gun violence and the tragedy that occurred in Highland Park. He shared that learning that these tragic events occurred so close to home drove him to, what to, um, to want to do something to help. It is not easy to rally helpers on a summer Saturday, but Rayhan managed to lead 25 students in washing cars for more than $700 in donations. While you can always expect to see Rayhan as a part of the student volunteer group for most any school event, Rayhan has also participated in service opportunities in the community, including Feed My Starving Children, the WGN Toy Drive, and several opportunities to support youth connections at his local mosque. We know that successful, service-oriented leaders understand the value of belonging in community, and Rayhan is no exception. Last year, Rayhan recognized the possible impact he could impress upon Maine East by helping our community understand Ramadan and the importance of fasting among our Muslim students and staff. Rayhan organized a fast-a-thon that was widely supported and attended by students and staff. The unique and impactful event caught the attention of local news and was celebrated as an outstanding opportunity to build connections with our Muslim community. As you can imagine, Rayhan's impact is also felt within our classrooms. Ms. Bonifazi has supervised Rayhan in PE Leaders Program. She said, quote, as a student of mine for nearly two years, Rayhan has proven his ability to use our five principles of exemplary leadership practices. He has modeled the way for others through peer teaching and role modeling, as well as an array of volunteer service hours throughout the community. Mrs. Braytek has been one of Rayhan's math teachers. She shared that, quote, Rayhan is a kind, caring student who never hesitated to help others in my class. He would not think twice about stopping whatever he was working on to answer questions his peers would ask of him. He would go out of his way to make sure they had a solid understanding, all while showing them respect. He was a model <laughs> student and a true leader in my class. Mr. Peters said that, quote, Rayhan is a terrific student and an even better person. Rayhan truly believes in serving his, community, his school and community and is always willing to volunteer to help at school events. His leadership and service has helped create a culture of service at Maine East. Rayhan's counselor, Ms. Block, shared that, quote, in the Student and Family Services Office, we enroll new students year-round. Rayhan is always one of the first students who I think of to help with welcoming new students to East. Even with his busy schedule, Rayhan is always willing to help with ensuring that students have a smooth transition to East. When Rayhan reflected on what his passion for leadership and service, or when his passion in leadership for service started, he credited the opportunities he has had in high school and also shared that he's just always valued people that put themselves out there, and that's what I want to do too. Maine East High School is grateful to have benefited from his value, from the value of Rayhan 
and we are eager to see what his future holds. While Rehan has expressed interest in exploring law school, he is also interested in school administration, specifically the high school principalship. Students of future generations would be lucky to have Rehan's energy and commitment to improving our com communities and their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Rehan Kaja. Rehan, can you for, um, introduce who do you have with you tonight? Uh, my father, my dad. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> and I know we referenced it um, very briefly, but can you just talk a little bit about what your plans are after high school? Um, currently all over the place, but uh, I'm thinking <laughs> in something in education possibly, or um, I was also interested in law, so that's something that I was interested in. So, but yeah, all over the place. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, and we'll move along to uh, Maine South, please. Maine South is pleased to recognize Colette Gordon as one of 207's best in the area of community service. When Colette was growing up, she spent a great deal of time on stage as a dancer and loved giving back to the audiences she performed for. That passion for giving back to her community and those around her grew into a desire to serve. And when high school began, she leaned into community service, both in her after school activities and in her academic studies, as she is now pondering medicine as a career. Currently, Colette is the president of Key Club, one of three officers in Medical Careers Club, a member of NHS, Science NHS, and Student Council. She also runs volunteer baking classes out of her house called Colette's Baking and Pastry School, where little kids from her neighborhood come over and take lessons on how to bake. Her youngest member is two. <laughs> She's also had her grandmother's knitting club attend as well. During COVID, she designed all of the advertising for school events, dances, spirit week, etc., and came up with the dissection program in Medical Careers Club where students dissected a fetal pig. She had another idea during COVID where nursing home residents got surprise gifts for Valentine's Day for seniors who were isolated. That program has continued and is in year three, and yet another idea of Colette's was for a program called Shoeboxes of Joy where students made packages of cards, books, and toys that were delivered to Lutheran General's pediatric wing. In Key Club, her favorite event is the Halloween craft fair during the Park Ridge Farmer's Market, where a table is set up and small children can partake and make pictures and crafts. Additionally, in Key Club at the Sheridan Nursing Homes, she runs the card, game, and craft nights. The high school students interact and play with the seniors, and many have formed strong bonds of friendship. All of these service opportunities have led her to consider medicine as a career, and she's taking advantage of our career programming and doing job shadowing in a pediatrician's office and general practitioner's office. Throughout her life, Colette's mother has been a major role model and influence. She's watched her mother succeed and work hard, and it has inspired her to do the same and follow in her footsteps. Erin Sanchez, Colette's counselor, says, Colette has made a meaningful impact at Maine South through her service to the community as president and participant in Key Club. Colette's impact reaches beyond Key Club, however, as she pours her best effort into everything she does, whether it's volunteering, running cross country and track, or earning straight A's in her numerous AP and accelerated classes. With her unfailingly positive attitude, generous spirit, and strong determination, Colette will undoubtedly continue to make a significant contribution to her community when she moves on to her bright future as a, as a college student and beyond. Sarah Sagmeister, her AP biology teacher, says, Colette is a charming person and an amazing science student. I challenged her to find a biology topic that she did not love. Impossible. She and I share a passion for the ETC and will always share this bond. Colette's health and wellness teacher, Scott Tumblety, says, Colette is a great kid who's always very upbeat, conscientious about herself and others in class, and always puts forth her best effort. Co Colette, congratulations on your award. You're very well deserving of it, Mr. Tumblety. Trevor Fritz, her AP psychology teacher, says, Colette is an excellent student who excels in the classroom, 
but more, more importantly, she is purposeful in helping make other people's lives better. Colette's AP chemistry teacher, Greg Nordle, says, Colette is a wonderful student. She's extremely conscientious and interested in learning. She takes her academics seriously and wants to learn chemistry. She's trying hard this semester since she took sophomore accelerated chemistry mostly virtually. Additionally, she's active in cross country, involved in a number of school activities. Colette embodies the ideals of Maine South education and takes advantage of the many opportunities and co-curricular activities it provides. She's a very deserving recipient of the 207's Best Award. Jim McGowan, her Key Club sponsor, says Colette has been an amazing member of Key Club for four years and currently serves as our president after serving on the executive committee last year as the vice president. Not only does she work tirelessly to provide service opportunities for over 200 active Key Club members, she was also our top volunteer last year, logging in, in a, an incredible 110 hours of service. That number is even more impressive in that it does not account for the countless hours she spent planning, organizing, and preparing materials for events. The service projects she's coordinated and participated in have ranged from feeding the less fortunate to visiting and working with the developmentally disadvantaged. She's organized craft projects for children at the Park Ridge Farmers Market for residents at senior centers, worked with Toys for Tots and Luthen General's Children's Hospital in providing gifts for those in need. She's run school supply drives with kids above all and shoe drives for souls for shoes. She's also continued to expand the club's take-home service opportunities to help students fit public service into their busy schedules. She's met monthly with and facilitated service opportunities in conjunction with our sponsoring Park Ridge Kiwanis Club, including trunk or treat, being bell ringers for the Salvation Army, and assisting with the Kiwanis Pancake Breakfast. Under Colette's leadership, the club has almost doubled in size. And a lot of that is due to her positive and inclusive attitude. She welcomes and interacts with all student volunteers in a way that makes them want to come back and serve again. Colette is a great leader and more importantly, a great person. I am so proud of her and so grateful I have had the opportunity to work with her. Congratulations. in uh, my early decision application to Scripps College, which is my number one choice school, and I plan on majoring in biology with the possible minor in neuroscience on the pre-med track, possibly going and specializing in pediatrics. And we will now move on to Maine West. All right. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Chris Modi, 207's best for Maine West. <laughs> Chris told a wonderful story when he met with Dr. McMahon to talk about his award tonight. Every Sunday, Chris goes to the Park Ridge Community Church to live stream their service for people who may be homebound and cannot attend in person. He wanted us to understand that so many more things count as service than most people think. You can always find something, he said. It's not just picking up garbage, though to be clear, Chris does that too. And he has <laughs> since he was about 12 years old. He found this opportunity on school links where he was looking around and clicked on the tab, Opportunities. In it, he scrolled through possibilities for career experiences in arts and communications, his fields of interest as an aspiring filmmaker. He found the position at the church and made the weekly commitment, and there you could find him every Sunday from 9.30 to 11.30. I asked Chris if anyone thought this strange, as he is not a Christian. Within his answer lies the definition of true service. It's really not for me. People who can't go to the service depend on me for their worship. They're a very welcoming church. They never asked me if I was Christian, and it wouldn't matter. They just need to reach people. And there it is. At the heart of service is a commitment to meet the needs of others before yourself, across town, across faiths, across difference. Chris has learned already that humanity is at its best when people reach across division to show love to one another. As accomplished as Chris is as a student, and he truly is, with a remarkably consistent record of success and rigorous study, 
What he has learned and has to teach about service is priceless knowledge he gathered well beyond the classroom. Chris began a life of service in middle school with a requirement of National Junior Honor Society. He continued this life of service because he loves it. Maybe the requirement provided the motivation to start, but Chris feels that people shouldn't do service just because they have to. So he picks up garbage for cleanup give back. He hangs ornaments and decorations for the display and Christmas tree lighting. He organized Main West Reading Renegades with the National English Honor Society at the Displains Public Library. He volunteers in Wheeling at a summer camp for middle schoolers about <coughs> space and robots. Seeking a departure from a typical high school summer job, Chris saw a flyer and decided to work for MNASR, the Maine Niles Association for Special Recreation, helping with soccer, crafts, movie days, and other activities. At Maine West, I'm going to take a breath before I read this next part because it's very long. <laughs> At Maine West, he is a drum major in the Marching Warriors, plays oboe in the Pitt Orchestra, is on math team, yearbook, soar, book club, tennis, Warrior Weekly, the Library Advisory Board, the Principal's Leadership Team, PE Leaders, NHS, has performed in several plays and is now a student producer and is an officer in multiple honor societies, including Tri-M, where he serves as co-president, NEHS, where he is the president, Science NHS, where he's the vice president. He is just a regular member of Spanish NHS, if I say goodbye. <laughs> but he's also the vice president of Key Club and one of our six commissioners in Link Crew as well, where he had the opportunity to lead a community <coughs> building circle with about 15 superintendents from around the country on Thursday morning. And he did an amazing job. Um, his service resume is over 19 pages long. It's understandable that he struggled to remember all the things he does. It seems sometimes as if everyone in Maine West knows Chris. His teachers certainly feel lucky to have known him as a student as well as a wonderful human being. Mr. Hounstein both teaches Chris math and coaches him in tennis. He is an exceptional young man for sure. His heart is always in the right place and he does a brilliant job of advocating for the positions he believes. Chris is genuinely kind and does nothing that would be considered self-serving. I find his disposition to be so pleasant and patient, he's really doing an extraordinary job of fully cultivating his high school experience. Mr. Segovia enthused about his time with Chris in freshman and English class. Chris was such a wonderful student to have in class. He was always prepared to take a leadership role in discussions and group work. In terms of his work ethic, Chris always went above and beyond to make sure that his final product was truly the best it could be. I anticipate that Chris will go on to do great things, and I'm so excited that he's being honored in this way. He absolutely deserves recognition. Great work, Chris. Keep reaching for the stars. Miss Murray remembers Chris as a freshman in AP Human Geography. It was an honor to be Chris's teacher. From the outset of class, it was clear that Chris was not only a team player, but someone willing to confront morally complex topics and situations for the betterment of the broader community. But in the everyday grind, Chris also embodies the famous quote of journalist Molly Ivins that manners are just a formal expression of how you treat people. Chris is always ready with a smile, a kind word, and an acknowledgement of someone's value in his education and life. I know Chris has so much to offer our community and world and very much hope he feels the warmth of gratitude we have for his gifts. Mr. Aguirre said Chris is a rock star in the classroom, but also as a person. Chris is a hardworking student with the biggest heart and a teenager any, any parent would love to have as a child. He's the kindest student I have ever had and works hard no matter what he is doing. Mr. Gerstmeyer admires Chris's kindness and compassion. Chris cares deeply for people, not some people, all people. His heart is huge for Maine West and District 207 and I firmly believe Chris is a force for good in our world. I am and will always be proud of the person he has become and excited for more of the world to get a chance to know him in the future. Teacher after teacher said things like amazing human and one of the most wonderful kids I've ever known and does so much and always with a smile, I can't include them all. His key club sponsor, Mrs. Garrity Rodinos, pointed out that the variety and volume of volunteering activities Chris has done means that every age group in Des Plaines has felt the impact of his service. This is part of the magic of a young man who told me, I didn't try to come here to be all these things, I just became. That's what happens when you put your love out into the world. What you become and what you create are truly special indeed. Thank you, Chris. So, um, who do you have with you today? 
my mom and my dad. All right, and excellent. And I asked them earlier if they're writing a book about how to raise great children. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, are, what are your plans for, uh, for after this year? Um, uncommonly, I would love to be a filmmaker. So, yeah. Filmmaker. Great. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. Well, you know, <clears throat> definitely my favorite part, all of our favorite part of the meeting, but this one really tugged today at the heart oh, yeah. The future is bright with these students, and thank you parents for what you've done to foster that. Um, this is your opportunity to have some photos taken with your school leaders and your parents. Um, so you may leave the meeting at this time. You are, of course, are welcome to come back, but don't feel like you have to. <laughs> <laughs> We'll just give them a moment. Okay, I have for public comments, I showed two, two public comments. One is Pam Melanoskis and Carrie Houghton. Welcome. We do have a three-minute limit on speaking. We're not public speakers. It's probably the most nerve-wracking thing we have to do. We have to carry teacher conferences. So, <laughs> um, good evening. First of all, I want to say thank you for continued efforts and support each school year um, as board members. We appreciate your time and commitment to us. Uh, we just want to introduce ourselves as we will be um, in attendance for board meetings. So um, my name is Pamela Nauskas. This is my fourth year in district, uh, my 11th year teaching. Um, I offer experience from um, working with Department of Defense um, as well as working in CPS. I don't have all that, but <laughs> my name is Gary Hilted. I'm in the CTE department here at South, and this is my 18th year. Also, yeah, so, CTE. So. <laughs> Um, we also wanted to share um, that as educators, we see the important role our board plays. Um, we'll be attending board meetings as this is where important decisions get made that affect our day to day. So it's important to have somebody here um, that has a lens of a teacher within the school district. So we just want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, I guess we'll be seeing you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also have another uh, card from Carrie Shook. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and we're helping I, you tonight. With, we do have a little. I'm going to put a, a couple going. seconds back on for you. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm an introvert, um, but my friends in other school and other school districts tell me that there are a lot of people coming out in trouble at school board meetings. And I thought, well, I better go to my school board meeting and give my support to our school board because. I don't want them to only get negative things from all these other people. And I kind of know there's nothing like that. But you won't see me again. <laughs> well, actually, we might want to. <laughs> well, and, and, and I want to and, and support, especially for continuing a complete, honest, and education, unsanitized for all of our students, whatever, you know, of all types. And I just I wish, that, I wish to support you with that. And, you know, so I'm not, I'm not funny if anybody else is arguing against this, so I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you for coming to see us today and speak. Okay. Uh, all right. We will move along to... Um, do we have anything else there? Okay. No. Okay. We have the Schuler presentation. Welcome, welcome. Hello, Good hello. to see you. Where should I be? Where? Wherever you like. There's a, there is a. Get, we're kind of out of here. Yeah, yeah. yeah come here. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually a. Wherever you feel. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Love to be back. I love meeting with you all once a year in the fall to update you on the Schuler program. Let's see how we go here. Okay. So I know there are a couple new faces. So just a quick recap of our mission. 
So the Schuler Scholar Program, uh, we work with high achieving students. Oh my, that's not where I wanted to go. Let's turn it again. I'm sorry. I was no, no, trying you're to let the board member on there see. Ah, I see. I see. So we work with high achieving students um, who also are typically underrepresented on college campuses. And our mission is to equip those students with the support and guidance that they need to get into highly selective colleges and then succeed at those colleges. We were founded in 2001 by Jack Schuler, who is a businessman who lives in Lake Bluff, so fairly local. Um, so our organization is completely privately funded by his family foundation. Uh, we first partnered with Maine East High School in 2010. So we've been here, this is our 13th year, lucky 13, right? This is our 13th year partnership with Maine East. <clears throat> so every time we come and visit and give you an update on our partnership, we really like to update you on three of our big organizational goals. First, to serve as many qualified students as possible. Second, to support those students in staying successfully in our program all throughout high school. And then third, supporting those students in matriculating to selective liberal arts colleges. So that's what I'll be sharing with you today. So first, starting with our program scale. This past year, we selected 25 new students into the Schuler program, and we're starting out the year serving a total of 92 students in the program. And you can see that the low 90s uh, is about where we've been sitting students served the past two years, but that, that's a pretty significant growth from what we've historically been serving at Maine's prior to the last two years. And we believe that the things that are really impacting that increase in that growth um, are the fact that we have improved our retention rate, and that we just have had really consistently strong incoming class sizes these past few years. When it comes to retaining students into our program all throughout high school, overall our retention trend continues to be really positive. There's a number of things that we point to that we believe contribute to that positive retention trend. Um, first, we are really committed to implementing culturally sustaining pedagogy in all of our programs. Second, we are really working hard to implement proactive academic supports. And then third, we're also really committed to collaborating and communicating consistently with families. We did have a handful of students withdrawn from the program this last year. A couple of them, a couple of the situations were due to not meeting the program's academic requirements um, significantly or consistently. And then we did have a few students who chose to withdraw themselves from the program, either because their college or academic goals no longer aligned with Schuler's mission. When we look back at the year behind us, uh, we always like to highlight where our students are struggling the most, um, so we can tailor our support to those areas. For our underclassmen, it was really AP Social Science and Science. Um, for our juniors, uh, STEM seemed to be the area where they, where they were struggling the most. And for seniors, there was really no trend. Um, we had individual students have their own unique individual challenges. So in order to support our scholars in navigating the rigors of challenging AP courses all throughout high school, what we do in our one-on-one -on -one programs is really focus on academic coaching <coughs> that we hope will help students become independent learners who can thrive in rigorous courses in high school and ultimately when they go on to these selective colleges. So the types of things that we are focusing on in our meetings with students include building executive skills, um, supporting them, and really echoing what their teachers are doing in class, um, teaching study skills, self-advocacy, help-seeking, and also providing opportunities for students to learn with each other in study groups. Turning to college attainment, so this is the list of colleges that seniors matriculated to last year. You can see a pretty amazing list of schools, including, including uh, several students who matriculated to Northwestern University, um, also Harvard, University of Richmond, McAllister, Tufts, Brown, uh, some really amazing institutions where students are now attending this fall. And equally important uh, as those names of colleges, are some of, the, some of the pieces of information on this slide. What I always really get excited about is this first bullet point, which is the amount of non-loan, so gift aid, that these colleges on the last slide are giving to Schuler students. So many Schuler scholars last year, on average, received over $69,000 in gift aid that's renewable for four years. So an incredible amount of gift aid from these institutions that they're attending, which will result in very little loan debt when they graduate. 
We also know that our students are doing well, they're moving through these institutions, graduating at a high rate. And we have a number of programs and supports when students get to college to continue to support them. Obviously, we're not in, uh, on site with them at all of those different colleges, but we do have a pretty amazing college and alumni programs department that offers mentorship opportunities, student and parent panels, resume workshops, internship fairs, things like that for our college scholars. We also offer a pretty significant scholarship for our students in college. Um, our scholarships and grants include a $1,000 stipend for students who are starting up for college to get those dorm room supplies and things that they need. Um, every Schuler Scholar in college earns a $2,500 per year college scholarship. If the scholar happens to be undocumented or documented, that number goes up to $15,000 <coughs> a year for a total of $60,000 over four years to cover what for other students might be um, covered in federal aid. And we also have some really exciting grants, including grants that cover college-sponsored health insurance programs, um, grants for students preparing for graduate school, and also grants to pay for unpaid internships so that if students in college are finding an opportunity that they're excited about as far as an internship, the, the, the fact that the internship may or may not be paid is not the barrier to them taking advantage of that. And on the, on the subject of alumni, I always like to highlight a couple stories and a couple individuals. This is Monica. Monica graduated from DePauw uh, just this past spring. Um, she is now pursuing her PhD in organic chemistry at Notre Dame. Uh, she named that doing research in chemistry while she was in her undergrad was really powerful. When reflecting on her time in Schuler, she really valued the programs that we offered focusing specifically on supporting her through the college application process. And she said that the college research and application skills she practiced in high school with us actually transferred really well to the graduate school process. And I also will highlight Harsh. Harsh graduated two years ago from Tufts. He is now working as a software engineer at Google. Um, he highlighted the fact that it was a post high school, pre-college internship at Google that really started the ball rolling for him with Google. He then had several internships with them, which ultimately turned into his full-time job now, which he really loves. Um, when he reflected on his time with Schuler and what pieces of it were most helpful, he thought about the variety of college prep programs and resources that we offer that he said really helped him feel more confident and comfortable when he was trans transitioning um, into college at Tufts. And when we look forward to the year ahead, um, something that we are always committed to improving is working for equitable outcomes across those three goals that I just shared, um, recruitment, retention, and our college outcomes. So that is and always will be our priority and our focus. Um, just a good thing to note too, we have made a pretty significant restructuring in our group programs. For the last 12 years, we have run weekly after school group programs for our students. Uh, but this year, based on student feedback and a number of other factors, we restructured that schedule, moving to a quarterly Saturday workshop schedule in order to allow students to better balance their commitments with other extracurriculars, homework, home responsibilities, et cetera, while still focusing on the important skills, information, and also community building that happens when we're as a group. And as far as reflecting on our partnership, um, I can never pass up an opportunity to say how grateful we are to Michael Wartig, to Mainies teachers, counselors, administrators, all the staff at Mainies. We really have the dream partnership with Mainies High School and are so grateful to be part of this community. Um, we are also really excited this year to continue building new relationships with some of the new leaders in the building, um, principal, a couple new department chairs. Um, so really excited to continue working with those folks as well. And as promised, short and sweet, everyone. Uh, <laughs> any questions for me today? Just a quick question. Um, as you mentioned here related to the, uh, the grants, undocumented students and also DECA students, yes. how do we verify or how those students apply on such category per se? Sure, like how do they let us know? Yeah. I usually, you know, we are providing them pretty intense support in the college application process which includes submitting a lot of pretty personal documents to the FAFSA and other things like that. So when students are getting into the college process, um, typically a student would need to self-disclose if they wanted to qualify for that additional scholarship with us. 
Okay. And along with that line, per se, uh, I know we don't have much international students who will go to high school uh, to possibly, um, um, you know, getting this opportunity. Mm. How's that relationship? Uh, does the international students qualify in some way or what? Sure. You know, we haven't really had a situation um, where, I mean, we have had plenty of students who are green card holders, and that process goes the same exact way as um, a citizen when it comes to financial aid. So, you know, that we've had plenty of students who are citizens, plenty of students who are green card holders, folks who are undocumented. As far as an international student, someone coming from another country, pr pretty rare because in order to be part of Schuler, they'd have to be living in the district um, and part of that partnership high school. Okay. Yeah. Because there are. Uh, nice size of international students uh, who's attending our, uh, let's say our district mm -hmm. per se mm -hmm. um, who happen to be in high school mm. and especially when the u.s dollar rates are so skyrocketing very expensive and their parents is really heavy on economic hardship not everyone is really rich to send their Absolutely. kids to Absolutely. Uh, and uh, i've been hearing some uh, uh, real hard Shit, difficulty stories with them so i was mm. just kind of wondering on that particular but mm -hmm. um one just quick question regarding related to that again, undocumented students and DECA. What would you say a percentage per se um, that they've been applying per this year, last mm -hmm. year, roughly? Like a percentage of, oh, our, well, of they, applicants yeah. to Schuler or to cop to, to the college? to the Schuler. You know, it's really tough to say again because typically many families are uncomfortable sharing that information, especially at the application stage. So usually, if folks are going to share that information with us, it's not till the juniors or, sh or seniors and realizing that the college process is coming and, and they need our they need to be really transparent for us to be most helpful to them. So it's a, I really couldn't honestly give you a, an accurate estimate because it's something that that often isn't disclosed till later. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, just to follow up on that, is is there any outreach that you do for families because you know because there are fears around mm -hmm. you know undocumented status to yeah. you know at least like support through the process or at least prepare? Um, yeah. Because because yeah, ju when they're juniors and seniors, they're in that mindset already. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you know, even kind of like that preparatory work towards it because you know the. The likelihood that we're serving undocumented students or students on DACA is yeah. great too. Absolutely, absolutely, for sure. It's something we think about in in large and small ways. For example, when we are going to present to eighth graders who academically qualify and their families, um, we make sure that our presentation materials have the dreamer butterfly. We're we're sending visible signals that we are friendly and supportive of folks regardless of their immigration status. We also explicitly explicitly name that in our presentation, right? Saying that regardless of immigration status, folks are welcome to apply. We encourage them to apply. So that's definitely a big part of how we conduct our outreach. We also have over the years in a number of like early outreach uh, endeavors to try to talk with students and families who are not yet in high school or not yet in eighth grade to start to socialize information about college and college access. So we've partnered with the libraries in years past. Um, Actually, just next week, I'm going out to visit. Um, there's a couple teachers at Gemini who really have strong relationships with us, and uh, the teacher of the Spanish for Spanish Speakers class always invites me out in October to come talk with her students six through eight. So, you know, we there's always more that we can do, but that's definitely something we're really mindful of because we know that just that lack of comfort and also lack of information can be a big barrier. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just very quickly added up the point regarding uh, there are many uh, ethnic not-for-profit social service organizations mm -hmm. who's been really supporting, for example, the DECA students, mm -hmm. their parents, family members, and so on, and they do have a great resource per se. Yeah. So um, it might be a interest of Schuller to reach out to ethnic immigrant uh, not-for-profit social service agencies to get those yeah. informations uh, and I'm sure they'll be glad to provide that yeah absolutely well. local partnerships right with, with folks so. who are embedded in your community yeah great idea thank you for that I'm new to the board so um, a question of how and when when and how <coughs> our students made aware of this program yeah so officially uh, we invite students to apply in it, really I'm usually going out to the middle schools in January of their eighth grade year and then they can choose to apply in that spring semester and then they begin with us in our programs the summer prior to freshman year of high school 
Um, as I mentioned, we do do a, a few early outreach, but the consistent um, piece is always the January um, invitation to apply. Yeah. Any other questions? Carly, thank you. It's, um, it's succinct and it's <laughs> wonderful, but it's, it's so impressive what you do, and we're really all proud to be affiliated with Schuler. Thank no, you all so done. much. We are too. We are yeah. proud to be part of 207. Yeah. Thanks so much, Thank everybody. You very much. Take care. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move along to the update from Superintendent. Ken? Okay, uh, very quickly. Um, not so quickly, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, our principals aren't here tonight, but they, they'll be back next month. Uh, it is Principals Appreciation Month. So we are incredibly blessed in this district to have um, three tremendous principals. We've had tremendous, tremendous principal and assistant principals, I might add, uh, and associate principals too. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been blessed in this district to have really great principals at all three of our buildings for many, many years. And um, the research on the importance of principals in the buildings is really, really clear in terms of the outcomes. We saw it on display last week. Um, when we hosted a group from folks around the country and also the Virgin Islands who got to see at each of our three campuses the amazing work that's that's going on. And most districts would be proud to have work in any one of the do domains that we showcase, to have the quality of work in any one of the domains. And the quality of work that's going on in each of the domains and the connectedness, the systems approach in, the, in those domains is amazing. That doesn't happen without incredible principal leadership. And so, though Melissa, Eileen, and Ben aren't here, we're going to uh, recognize them this week, and I'll try to remember to recognize them next month when they do, yeah, when they do get should, back. We should have them here uh, to say, it, yeah. good job. But, uh, mm -hmm. but I wanted to recognize that publicly tonight, that um, it is Principals Month, and our principals deserve a lot of appreciation um, for everything that they do. And, and then finally, you know, I mentioned the AAA, 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 AASA visit that happened last week. Chris uh, Modi from West, who was here, actually led one of the circle groups for the administrators that were there, and um, it was just amazing. I think the feedback that I got from um, not, not just superintendents, but there were teachers and administrators from different buildings and districts around the country was just the quality of the work that's being done here, the quality of our people, how amazing our students were. Um, I'm always so proud, uh, and I think the best part of anything, just like the best part of these events are, you know, when we hear from the kids. Similarly, last week, the panels that our students were on and led, the panels on equity, the panels on uh, the restorative practices, and we featured West in particular, um, though we could have featured any one of our three schools, led by our students and their voices was just nothing short of amazing. Uh, the adult learning panel uh, that um, we led, uh, Jill, Jill Karras, who's not here tonight, but, but led that, uh, showcased what I think is the foundation of everything. And then we closed the event with Mary, who was able to uh, showcase all of the ways that we've oriented the learning spaces in our three buildings to really reflect how we do the work today. And so it was just, a, it was an amazing event. Uh, the feedback that we've gotten has just been tremendous. I've been on a lot of these visits. I don't think many of them happen that are that are of higher quality than what we were able to provide here at District 207. So proud of the work, and that's all for me tonight. Okay. Uh, okay. Any updates from board members? I do. Uh, just I would like to uh, uh, invite or uh, reach out to the District 207 students uh, regarding a uh, Death Plain American Region Post 36. Uh, they're uh, serving 130 year, and they are oldest veterans organization in the northwest uh, suburb of Chicago area. They chartered in August 1, 1920, and their members have been proudly served the Des Plain community and surrounding area throughout the entire 103 years with civic pride and respect for the American region. Uh, their main mission uh, of the American region is veterans serving veterans and then participation in the uh, community. And the purpose uh, for inviting um, uh, our district students is to a upcoming community event uh, that Post 36 is planning on 
June 23rd, 24th, 25th, next year, in year 2023. Uh, on these days, uh, they are planning to bring to Lake Park in Des Plaines the Traveling Korean War Memorial. It's a uh, goal to honor uh, Korean veterans who served in the Forgotten War from June 25, 1950 through June 27, 1953. Uh, so next year, 2023, is a commemoration of Korean War Armistice for 70th anniversary and also 73 year anniversary of Korean War uh, start. So there will be having a um, special um, opening ceremonial and also uh, exhibition of my 25 years of uh, collection of Korean War memorial artifacts that I, yes, your, I've, yes, I've Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. and I will be probably independently, individually, I probably have the most uh, Korean War related collections uh, in, in probably in the United States, but uh, uh, working with the partnership with the Post 36, uh, we'll be uh, posting and doing an exhibition uh, at their location. So um, this will be a very educational for the students. So uh, if I would like to reach out to the three uh, schools, uh, if the students could able to make a visit uh, the Post 36, uh, the commander and everyone will be happy to uh, have a special meet and greet programs and uh, they will be happy to talk about uh, the war related to Korean War specifically but plus with other uh, you know, war experience as well. Uh, so um, I, I thought it would be a great educational uh, experience for the students uh, and also for the community as well. So I um, would like to share that and then I will be sending out the information to uh, Dr. Ken Wallace soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. I also we had something to mm -hmm. share. Um, I want to say this so it's not just Ken saying good things. I wanted to make sure it was coming from everybody. And, uh, um, and this was, I had a chance to um, lead a group of nursing students and their professor through Maine East last week. And um, the college students who aren't that far removed from high school, right? They just were like in awe of everything that they saw. They said, and particularly in the CTE wing, they said, wow, I can't believe that these kids are gonna be able to get a CNA before they graduate. Yep. Um, that was one thing they were like, they said high school was not at all like this when I was in school. And I'm like, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and they were, they said, these teachers act like they really want to be here. <laughs> and the kids act like they want to be here too. And I said, isn't that great? And so I just wanted to share with you what a, I mean, it's coming from everywhere. And I just, I was so happy to hear that. And it really made me feel very proud of where what we do. So I just wanted to share that with Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Terry. Terry. <clears throat> Anyone else? Including Mr. Patras? Mm -hmm. Nothing here, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we will move on to the policy committee update. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, our policy committee meeting was held on September 13, and uh, myself and uh, board member Ed Ecker uh, was attended at 9 a.m. And then we had a, a discussion related to press policy review uh, was um, held after careful review of current revisions to IASB press policies, uh, which include continuous improvements, footnotes, name changes, and updates due to changes in law. The following District 207 policies will go into the first reading at the today's uh, uh, Board of Education meeting. Uh, 2-230, public participation at school board meeting and petition to the board. And 3-70, succession of authority. 4-10, physical and business management. 6-140, education of homeless children. 76-290, homework. 7-15, students and family privacy rights. And 7-8285, 
uh, MFLE access prevention responses and food allergies management programs. Uh, that will be on uh, to tonight's uh, board meeting. And there will uh, be no further business to come before, so uh, we are joined the policy committee at 9.49 p.m. Thank you, Jen. We'll move along to the education committee update. Sure. Yeah, so the education committee um, met <coughs> on September 13th, 2022. Present at that meeting were myself, board member Collins, board member Eicher. We called the meeting to order at 9.49 a.m. There were no public comments. Um, we, we started with a presentation on the multi-tiered systems of support, um, MTSS for short. Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Innovation, Dr. Sean Mesmer, noted MTSS is our way of supporting students of all levels to be successful. Um, Dr. Mesmer, Mesmer then introduced Dr. Kelly Morrissey, who is the Director of Personal Learning and Student Support. Dr. Morrissey defined the program as providing systems of support using data to monitor expected outcomes and our practice of intervention with students layered amongst three tiers. So starting with tier one, um, all students have access to tier one at all times. It is the support all students get. Um, tier two is added for about 15% of our students who need targeted support in a specific area. And tier three is one-on-one -on -one intervention, which is about 5% of our population um, who may need it at any given time. Uh, this is especially important for students not qualifying for an IEP and who need that added support. Uh, Maine West is piloting an MTSS coordinator at the building level this year to ensure that MTSS interventions are delivered systematically, systemically and with fidelity. Um, next was the AP Longitudinal Report. Dr. Mesmer shared an AP, this report outlining AP scores between the years of 2010 and 2022. Beginning with the 2014-2015 school year, the district removed systemic barriers to students accessing AP, which led to a subsequent rise in the number of test takers. Um, from about 2018 until now, the district has seen a significant increase in the number of students earning a three or above on the AP exam. The district also examined the impact of the pandemic on AP test takers, and as expected, COVID did have a negative impact on AP test scores as evidenced in overall performance in 2020-2021. However, all but the district's calculus scores have bounced back in the 2021-22 school year. The math team is investigating why this is the case. However, math courses being sequential and building upon each other, um, we, would, we could be seeing a group of students missing sufficient practice in particular skills that we will need to screen for and address curricularly. Um, we adjourn this meeting at 11.10 a.m. Thank you, Sheila. <coughs> we are moving along to the Finance Committee update. Linda? Thank you. So the Finance Committee met on September 26, 2022. Members present were myself, Board Member Patras, and Board Member Yosef Abramson. The meeting was called to order at 5 p.m. and there were no public comments. One of the issues that we discussed was the health insurance renewal for 2023. Assistant Superintendent for Business, Mary Kalu, noted that this will be the first time in many years that it will be necessary to make plan design changes and a premium increase to our medical insurance plans. Premiums have been greater than claims for the PPO plan, therefore no premium increase is needed. Over the past two years, the HMO plan claims have been much higher than the premiums. A premium increase of 20.2% is needed to keep projected claims in line with projected premiums. The HSA plan premium will also increase by 0.9% due to higher claims. A premium holiday will again be recommended for the month of December. There will be a PPO and an HMO plan design change recommended for emergency room copay which will move from $200 to $250 per visit, but is waived if the, if the patient is admitted. This is due to the three-year rolling average cost of the PEPM -E exceeding 5%. The next item that we discussed was exception of audit. Sheridan Jurgensen, a partner at Eder Casella, 
ran through the audit just completed for the fiscal 2022 year, reporting overall that the audit went very well with no errors, no material misstatements, no audit adjustments, nor disagreements with the auditors. New standards had no effect on the audit report. Much time was spent on internal controls, written policies, and procedures, which are all being followed appropriately. A single audit for federal awards and grants was tested for compliance with no issues. The annual financial report shows a highly acceptable rating of 3.9 out of 4. A rating of 4 is projected once the referendum debt is lowered. An audit is performed annually as required by law. The final item that we discussed was District 207 Administrative Agent for EdRed. D207 has been the administrative agent for EdRed since its inception in the 1970s. An IGA was approved in the 1990s outlining the fiscal services and dis the district provides. The district has been working with EdRed Director to create a new fiscal agent plan which includes the purchase of their own umbrella insurance to mitigate risks in the area of technology services and liability slash workers' compensation. The updated fiscal services agreement will be brought for a quick attorney review prior to review by the Science Finance Committee and finally will go to the full board for approval. There were no other items to be discussed and the Finance Committee meeting was adjourned at 5.43 p.m. Thank you. That was a very busy meeting. Busy, busy. Okay, moving along to the Buildings and Grounds Committee update. Terry, are you doing sure. this? Sure. Okay. <coughs> the um, Buildings and Grounds Committee uh, uh, meeting was held on September 26, 2022. Members present, Linda Coyle and Jim Lee. Um, Member Lee called the meeting to order at 5.44 p.m. There were no public comments. There was a construction update uh, by Lisa Keen, project manager for uh, Pepper Construction, provided a uh, construction update for September. The only um, Main West construction project to be completed is the elevator with, which will be inspected by the ROE this week. A ribbon cutting ceremony was held on Friday, September 16th. Concrete work on Main East Field House should be finished in November. Next up is installation of the wood flooring, which will go out for bid this month. The pool is still in process and trims and finishes are being made to the locker rooms. The locker room bathrooms are mostly finished and the pool is coming along at Main South. The corridor flooring is being worked on during the second shift. Coming up is bid package five, which will complete the remaining work at East and South. Both schools are on schedule to be finished by the summer of 2023. And the um, being no further business, the meeting was adjourned at 5.54 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> We're gonna move along to monthly status of finances. Mary? In your board packet is the August financial report. Um, you will see a revenue variance probably for the next three or four months as property taxes which represent about 80% of our revenue are late. That's why you see such a big change between 2020 when they were on time and went out and were received in August. And this year, um, expenditures are in line with where we would be at this point in the fiscal year. And, um, everything else is on track. I will entertain any questions that anybody has on the August financial statements. Hearing that, we'll move along. Um, instructional services, Sean? Yes, yeah, so in your board packet, you'll find uh, our annual summer school update. Uh, it gives an, an overview of the courses we taught, the attendance of the students, as well as sports camp information is included in that report as well. Um, I think we have added the financials. Mary, do you wanna speak to those as well? Yeah, the financials are, are fairly consistent with prior years, we always kind of lose a little bit money on regular at summer school. Um, new this year, we added those courses provided by the Title III grant, which is our English Language Learners Grant. So um, that's why you'll only see a one-year comparison for that. Um, 
as we continue to move forward with that, we'll show the year's trends. Um, athletics, no surprise to the schools lost money, but they were offset by a huge enrollment in the athletics enrollments at South this summer, which um, created a surplus for them. Okay. Quick question. Uh, was there a challenge uh, during the summer school hiring for teachers, per se? A shortage? Yeah, shortage. Um, and we actually have done pretty well recently. Um, we have reduced some of that summer school footprint to students who need to catch up. And we've, we've actually changed the way we've done that. Students who are very close now only will attend summer school until they've passed the course. And so that actually has siphoned off some of the numbers that have to do a full summer um, remediation process. Uh, we've been able to, to have those teachers, we have those in person, those classes, but many of our classes now have moved to um, a virtual environment, which makes uh, the benefit of that is um, we actually have many of our own teachers teaching those courses, um, just by the nature of, of a virtual course, being able to do that either from the building, um, be flexible with students, um, so that's been a popular option we've stayed with. So overall, related to um, any upcoming, uh, because nationwide we are seeing a, a great shortages on teachers and professors at the universities and so on, will we be having uh, challenges uh, in upcoming short? Well, I can I can let uh, Mr. Dagger speak to that. We have a number of retirements coming up, and I know he's yeah starting you know, to beat the bushes and recruit. Yeah. We you know through the retirement uh, notifications, we have an idea of what we need to hire down the road. I think some of the things that we're doing is kind of looking ahead to look at our current staff mm -hmm. to see if we can help support them getting certification in other areas, like for example, computer science, met with Melissa uh, and the Math MCC to look at internally, see what we can do. So we have projections. We're also looking internally what we can do differently. And um, I think we'll be, we'll be prepared to kind of look forward. One of the things that um, we started we advertised last year, started this year. Uh, we now have a full educational pathway. So several courses over sophomore, junior, and senior year, uh, ending in a dual credit course, uh, which is geared towards students to help them determine, do I want to be in education, find that out early, earn some credits before they leave, and then get into an education program when they go uh, off to college. So we're excited about that. We really targeted students of color. Um, this year and we have a section running of exploring the teaching profession which is the dual credit course in each of our buildings and so that's that's kind of one of the things we're trying to do to in a grow your own kind of program so it's good to know uh, strategically that uh, uh, we do have a plan in our district but along the line maybe you know uh, Coming soon, hopefully, maybe if you can do a little presentation about the uh, teachers' concern shortage related to uh, that particular issues, and if there's any support from the board members, if we know in advance, uh, we you know we are trying to find a way to fully support and such. To, so. We've actually had strong uh, applicant pools, except in the areas that we traditionally haven't had strong applicant pools prior to the pandemic. Uh, so in CTE, for example, there are some, some areas in CTE that were hard to fill five years ago. They're still hard to fill because the colleges don't produce a lot of CTE teachers. But core subject area teachers, we still have strong pools uh, in those areas. So we haven't seen um, real shortages there. It's been the areas that have always been difficult to fill. Um, so, but you know, to, to Sean's point about the dual credit uh, path and teacher pathway, four years ago about 2% of our students identified teaching as a career of interest. So it's up to 7%. That's a 350% increase just in the last four years. So I think, and more and more districts I think are going this way where they're really trying to grow a pathway forward to address the, the shortage um, that's out there. Good to know. So I had a question. So, um, just looking at the summer enrollment for academics and athletics, it doesn't seem like East and West has bounced back as much as South. Is that just because of just sort of the demographic and, and the, still the COVID, the effect of COVID, and that they were virtual last summer? 
So the um, particularly one of the, one of the things we need to disaggregate a little bit more for this report. Since we've gone to virtual, the way that we've tracked students, so we might have West students that are actually being taught by a South teacher yeah. in a South program, and so they're counted at South, not as West students. Uh, um, and so that's that's a little bit of an anomaly in the data there that we're aware of on the inside, but I, we haven't gotten over to the reporting Okay, so there yet. may not be that, like, we, um, not as much of a bounce back for those two schools. We haven't really seen a huge dip particularly in sports camp. Yeah. Um, that's been remaining pretty steady. Um, East and West Pike, honestly, historically have had significantly fewer populations of students in, in summer school. Yeah. A lot of that has to do Long with term. you have to write a check for summer school. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of always been the case. Uh, one of the things we did do to, we switched a few years ago, is we started to not charge students who are um, economically challenged for courses they need to make up or remediate um, to, to kind of level that playing field a little bit. Um, it it's never, never feels quite right if a student who can afford to make up a class and gain and is, an, is an advantage over a student who, by no fault of their own, can do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's good. We do that pretty consistently, right? Across right. Every student who's on free and reduced who needs remediate, actually every student who this year, I think yeah, every remediation did. student, because we have we ESSER funds. We have ESSER money. Okay. So we, yeah. not just the free and reduced student, it's everybody across the board. If it's a required, something they need for? Yes, yeah. it's a required okay. course for graduation. Okay. Thank Sean, you. There's a question, and you alluded, it to, alluded to it in the memo regarding the cost incurred to support special education program, programming required by law. And, you know, looking at the numbers and the deficit, are those offset to any degree? Um, as you had mentioned, I think, I don't remember, there was another one you said was offset by increased enrollment. Is this the, offset the by The program is yeah. Yeah. offset. Um, so the only computer. little bit of funding we get is there's a little bit of special ed summer school, which amounts to about under $10,000 to help offset, but we are required by law mm -hmm. for those students who meet what's called extended school year to provide those services. Yeah. They're, they're required through the IEP process right. to receive the service. I'm just wondering, within the budget, is there any offset from revenue coming in elsewhere to that? No. No. <laughs> any other questions? Okay. Um, moving on to the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. Sure. So there's, in your board package, you'll find we do this every year. Um, you can see uh, our students from East, West, and South listed there for national merit semifinalists and also those who were commended. So these are some of the top test takers on the PSAT um, that students take in their sophomore year. Um, so you'll see uh, the names there and we'll any questions you might have. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, Ken, monthly update on FOIA requests? Uh, to this month and maybe you've been responded to or you're in the process of being responded to. Okay. Item 7, Board of Education Policies, this is the first reading. George? In your board packet are the policies that Mr. Lee described uh, that we met. We used press policy to guide our discussion. Uh, two things I just want to highlight is board policy 370, succession of authority. That is a brand new policy uh, that we added. Uh, and we will, as we go through this process, if approved, we will put together a procedural plan for that. Uh, the second item is uh, Board Policy 410, Fiscal and Business Management. Up in the room, Mrs. Kalu. Yeah, there was, um, <coughs> press doesn't have paragraph 5, which talks about uh, adoption of an, a balanced budget and when a deficit spending plan is. I think that press eliminated that paragraph because the legal school budget that we have to file has a deficit reduction plan that is, follows the school code. So I think that this was in conflict with what that um, legal budget is, and you don't want to conflict. Therefore, we chose to remove this, knowing that deficit reduction plans are covered and will always be covered under the legal school budget form. We have not had to file a deficit because all of our deficits have occur occurred in the capital projects fund and were funded through a bond referendum. I just want to make clear, it, it, the fact that it was in conflict didn't mean we were in violation no. of the law. No. Um, it just sometimes, just has two different sometimes things we have yeah. might be 
more stringent than what the law requires. And mm -hmm. so we, we don't, you know, we do evaluate sure. that when we go through policy. And, it, and we make a decision. Do we want to be more stringent or not? This was one we decided. We, yeah, not. because when you, with the def, when you adopt your budget, you're looking at the definition of an unbalanced budget in the deficit reduction plan on the legal budget form. If we left this language as it is, you'd have to then also say, oh, wait, I recall there might be this paragraph in board policy that has me also do something that's a little bit different than what the law requires. And it's just that conflict where, you know, 15 years from now, somebody, <laughs> if there's a deficit reduction plan, they would need to also remember to go check board policy. Okay, and I also just want to mention the succession of authority. That's something that it's a policy that we're adopting. This is actually new, uh, but it's important. Uh, I know the policy committee felt that it was important to um, have that in place. And when you do have that, maybe you could bring that forward to us just for information to know what the succession plan is. Any other questions on this? This, again, is the first reading. So if you do have any questions, feel free to ask, and uh, we'll be coming for the second reading uh, next time. Okay, um, moving along to item eight, which is the consent agenda. Could I please have a motion on items eight A through E? So moved. Second. second. Collins? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Iker? Aye. Lee? Aye. Patris? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Owen? Aye. I have a motion on item nine. This is a second reading on a textbook adoption. So Second. Okay. John? Yeah, it says it is the second reading. Uh, the adoption of the novel Sing, Unburied Sing. Uh, we're recommending that from our English department, and I'll entertain any questions that anyone might have. Any questions? We went over this last month. It was also gone over, I believe, in Education Committee. So it should be familiar to everyone. Okay. Ginny, would you take the roll? Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Patris? Aye. Lee? Aye. Iker? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Collins? Aye. Owen? Aye. I have a motion on item 10, approval of the 2021-2022 audit. So we move. Second. Okay, Mary? Um, with this motion, you approve both the 2207 audit, which was presented at the September 26th Finance Committee meeting, as well as the NSERV audit, which we do as an administrative agent of NSERV. NSERV also presents their audit to their board of control. Okay. Any questions? I know this was discussed and gone over at length at the meeting, but are there any additional questions at this point? Everything was clear. No yeah, management letter, clear. no... No management letter, no statements, no adjustments, no... Well, very vanilla. as usual, <laughs> thank you, Mary. <laughs> thank you, Mary, <laughs> for that. Uh, you can't take that for granted at all. So uh, any questions or comments on that? All right, Ginny? Lee? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Patris? Aye. Iker? Aye. Collins? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Owen. Aye. Could I have a motion on item 11? This is the 2023 health insurance renewal. So moved. Second. Mary. Um, with this motion, it will set the premiums for all four of the medical insurance plan as well as the dental plans for calendar year 23. It will implement a premium holiday because we had good past performance in the month of December, and we'll do that slight plan design change to the emergency room copay. This was also discussed at the finance committee meeting. So and, and the insurance committee. I mean, and the insurance committee. I mean, for the newer board members, there is a, a committee that evaluates insurance. It's got board members, Coyle and I are on that, and then um, teachers are uh, present on that. Mary, of course, is there. Um, and there's a discussion, so there's a really good, healthy discussion about what's the best way to handle things. This year was a year we really needed to make some decisions about what to do because for the first time in many years, we actually had, in our insurance plans, we've, we've done great, but we actually had an issue where we had to make design changes. Um, we have contractual language in the collective bargaining agreement that kind of sets up when it's appropriate to do a premium holiday, under what circumstances, 
um, expenditures if they increase on a three-year rolling average greater than 5% in terms of cost, then we look at plan design changes to bring that increase back down to an average of 5%. Um, this year was an extraordinarily bad year. Um, and last year was a bad year for the HMO as well, but we, we were hoping, we didn't do a premium increase because we were hoping maybe it would right size, and it ended up, it stayed bad and got a little worse, so, which is why we're looking at a larger premium increase this year. If we were to not do a premium increase, <laughs> it would just get bad probably again next year, and at one point, you know, we then we have that compounding effect, effect of trying to have the revenue catch up to the claims. As we discussed it um, at the committee meeting, uh, so what was the like approximately how much increase per the employees and the teachers will have to pay for HMO so, per se? Yeah, on the HMO side, because the board pays the lion's share of the premiums for a single coverage, it's gonna go up about $6 for the employee for um, each month, which is about $3 a paycheck. And then for family, it's gonna go up about $65 or about $32 a paycheck. On the board side, per um, month, the board's gonna contribute an additional $114,000 for single, $114, I'm sorry, not thousand. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, about $280 more per month for family coverage. So you will release uh, the, with the teachers, the employees, will be able to apply uh, on end of December to move it forward for the next year or? Correct, so we do a premium holiday, so on Janu the January premiums will reflect these increases. They are getting a holiday for the month of December. Correct, which will offset about six months of the um, increase. increase. But it's, it, is, it is not something that we can under fund or we will be back here in a year talking about a 40 percent increase in premiums to cover the expenditures yeah I, and i think it's important that everybody knows that that um we talked about the premium holiday should we do it should we not but because it's based on really past performance and you know it's important to know the pbo did well and the high deductible yeah. plan did really well it's that hmo that has that mm -hmm. anomaly that it it we thought it was right. And, and we, we thought we'd also share the wealth because it's like, wealth. okay, if the exactly. PPO generated their money to have a premium holiday, should we, is it, do you just give the premium holiday to the PPO? And we were like, no, mm -hmm. we're right. all for one, one for all. So if we, we all did good as a, a collective plan, we're going to all reap those rewards. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, the, so it means um, uh, overall, even though PPO we did good, uh, compared to, but we we be still increase some small amount, or are we just going to say the PBO same? premium? It, the premiums are projected to cover the claims for calendar year right. 23, so no increase is needed. These are all um, determined on an actuarial formula by our benefit broker, so they run it through and they look at it in an 18-month mm -hmm. process, taking out large claims, looking at medical trend based on the various plans. So if there's um, this is. An, an estimate that is backed by an underwriter in the medical profession. Okay, any other questions on this? Then maybe <coughs> would you take the roll on this? Iker? Aye. Lee? Aye. Patris? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Collins? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Owen? Aye. Could I have a motion on item 12A, Navigate 360? This is the Alice Safety Training. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. George? Uh, Navigate 360 is our Alice safety training that we use. It's an education program to train our staff. Uh, we are required to train our staff or participate in an active shooter drill within 90 days of the first day of school. Uh, we've used this program in the past, so this, again, is the program that we use to prepare our staff for the actual tabletop discussion. We did provide the board a crosswalk, I think, from the American Psychological Association mm -hmm. uh, with the ALICE training. Just the ALICE trainings evolved a lot over the years to reflect some of the changes in thinking and even the changes in law. 
This is not a new concha, right? No. No, no. we've no. been having this for the yes, many, many, many years, years right? many years. And, and uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I seem to recall there was recent legislation that kind of changed some of the, the yes. strat practices yes. Yes. that we've incorporated yes. that I think oh, that's we how, were yeah. able to be a part of. Right. So, yes. so I appreciate that. No the, simulations. That. Right, of, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Would you take the roll on this, Jean? Coyle? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Collins? Aye. Iker? Aye. Patras? Aye. Owen. Aye. I have a motion on item 12B, the NTDSC Special Education Services and Staff. So moved. Second. Uh, Katie? Sure. So um, in your board packet, you have a copy of the Intergovernmental Agreement that we asked each year for the board to approve with um, NTDSC. This is to help support our students that do have more significant and complex needs that cannot be met within the district. Um, and so the cost is outlined there. There was no change in cost for the tuition this school year, just a change in cost for individual aid. Um, and we went from seven and a half students to eight um, for this school year. And then we, the only change that was made to the contract was to update based on the law change that previously students um, would stop the day before their 22nd birthday and now they have to finish up the school year. Um, and so that was a legal change, so we just had that change made to the contract. But otherwise the contract is the same. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Would you take the roll? Patris? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Iker? Aye. Collins? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Owen? Aye. Could I have a motion on item 12C? This Don't is the. Yeah, thank you. Second. Okay, Katie. All right, so Max, and we've had a contract with Max since 2017-18, um, and we do rely on Max for some of our healthcare staffing services. Um, they actually broke off, and their, their company split, which is why they had to bring back the IGA, and they did make a change in rates. Um, really, what we've used this for is one-to-one -one nursing when we've needed that for students, as well as for um, specialized teaching assistants, or if we've been unable to fill a teaching assistant position. Um, this year we have, last year we had the highest needs that we've had for Maxim, and this year we have um, less needs that we need to use through Maxim. Um, so we do equal see a reduction there. Um, but we do rely on them to cover some of those needs when we're unable to fill. Okay. Um, any questions that you need to ask? Overall, uh, this, this semester that we've been, again, uh, contract with and dealing with, are they possibly from the state of Illinois or us, even though we do not have a jurisdiction as such, uh, but of course we are supposed to accommodate local state of Illinois as much as possible. How has that been going these days? So Maxim is local. Um, Trying to remember which time they're actually out of Chicago, so they're local. Um, and so we always try to look for things that are local first. But when we get into specialized needs, the number one priority that we have is making sure their students' needs are met. So we always look at that piece to make sure, um, because sometimes these are very highly specialized. And as you know, nursing, for example, is a very um, a field that right now is struggling, and Maxim has been able to meet those needs when we've needed to. Um, and so we've been pleased with the services since 2017. Okay. Any other questions? Would you take the roll? Patras? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Lee? Aye. Collins? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Iker? Aye. Owen? Aye. If I have a motion on items 12D and E, if it's okay, we'll take those together. So moved. Second. Second. So these next two contracts just have to do with providing behavioral therapy and consultation services um, due to some very significant and individualized needs that we have. Um, these really are providing behavioral therapy for students who are significantly aggressive for themselves and others in order to help um, teach them skills to better manage so that they can become safe citizens um, and yeah. to just manage just the just learning just environment. So um, we had to seek additional support in order to meet these needs for these two students. And some of those specific details were shared in a board note. And then we'll entertain any questions in relation to the behavior therapy that we were seeking. Any questions or comments? OK. Would you take the roll? Lee? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Collins? Aye. Iker? Aye. Patras? 
Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Owen? Aye. Okay, uh, item 13 is calendar items. Um, just to note again, the joint annual conference for IASB Triple I um, is November 17th <coughs> through 19th. Anyone who wants to register, please let Ginny know. Um, does anybody have anything to add to this? Okay. Uh, are there any other communications or public comments? Okay, could I have a motion to go into closed session for purpose of purposes of review of closed session minutes and appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees? So moved. Second. Okay. Roll. Collins? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Iker? Aye. Lee? Aye. Patras? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Owen? Aye. Okay. We are in closed session. Could I have a motion to return to open session? So moved. Second. Collins? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Iker? Aye. Lee? Aye. Patras? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Owen? Aye. Could I have a motion on item 17A through D? So moved. Second. Okay, Jenny, would you take the roll? Collins? Aye. Iker? Aye. Patras? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Lee? Aye. Owen? Aye. Could I have a motion on item 18A, approval of closed session minutes? So moved. Second. Okay. Would you take the roll? Patras? Aye. Iker? Aye. Collins? Aye. Yusuf Abramson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Coyle? Aye. Owen? Aye. There are no other closed session items. Could I have a motion to adjourn? So. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay.